this week I've come down to the seaside, well, a seaside of sorts. I'm on the North Norfolk coast, about eight miles to the west of Sheringham, and that's at Blakeney. Uh, Bill Hayward here with me. You're an ex postmaster of Blakeney. How long have you lived here? Oh, about 33 years. So you can tell me all there is to know about the place, can you? I'll try. Right, we'll start with the history. Um, how did Blakeney start? Well, Blakeney is a very old village. It was formerly called Snitterley, and I think it's registered in the Doomsday Book as the village of Snitterley. Uh, after that, it became a, a port of some size, even before Liverpool and Southampton were thought of, and uh, used to export to, no doubt, to the continent, but a lot to Iceland. Coal, uh, wood, timber and salt used to go to Iceland and in turn they brought back fish. So the fish industry s still remains with Iceland today, doesn't it? So did Blakeney start as a fishing port? I think fishing had a lot to do with it, yes. And the sea, was, uh, the sea came up to the quay uh, in deeper waters than it does today. We're uh, very much shallower. Uh, the sand has silted up and the port has been taken. This was a port bef before the First World War. The sailing ships still came up to the quay up until the First World War. But with the, uh, I suppose, the submarine warfare, the harbour closed and the sand silted it up. And now it's just a pleasant holiday resort where yachts can sail and uh, people can relax. How many people live here during the winter? Well, the Register of Electors has uh, 750 names on it. That's people up to 18. And if we take, say, what, 100 under 18, we'll say 850 at a rough guess in winter time. Well, I say in winter because you must have a, an awfully large summer population of visitors and so on. Yes, there are. The, we've got a large caravan park. It's, it's obscured. It's, it's not um, very obvious. But there's a large caravan park and, of course, each house welcomes guests during the summer, and so I said, wouldn't mind hazarding that the population goes up to about 2,000. So Blakeney really depends upon its tourist population now? To a great degree, yes, it does. Where are you going to take me to next? Well, shall we go up to the wardrobe? That, uh, you, you don't know what the wardrobe is at the moment, do you? No. Well, it's a, it's a society formed out of the Women's Institute to uh, manage clothing for, um, for theatres and... Um, amateur productions and that sort of thing. Well, I've moved across from the seaside of Blakeney, across the A149, which is the main Chroma Kingsland Road, to what I'm told is um, Blakeney Wardrobe. Now, with me is Velda Sprott. Well, what is it? Blakeney Wardrobe Society has out garments for parties or for plays. How did it originate? It's a bit of an unusual thing, isn't it? Oh, well, we had just a lot of acting clothes because Blakeney's always been a keen place for acting. And um, we had so much that we formed it into a society. How long ago is that? 27 years. We started in a stable um, and loft in the village. And two years ago, we had to move from that because it's being turned into a house. And then uh, moved up here... It was a brand new shed. How many, I've just looked at the shed and there are lots and lots of costumes in there. We'll go back down again in a minute. How many costumes do you think there are down there? Never have counted them. About a hundred, whole oh, hundreds, I should think. What sort of costumes do you make and have you got? We uh, get given modern clothes and we try and turn them into uh, period costumes. Nearly all our stuff is period uh, stuff. Uh, so we've got some original Victorian things and one famous coat, which uh, is 18th century. Now, I'm up in the sewing room in your house. Does that mean you actually make costumes still for Yes, plays? yes, constantly keeping, ma making and mending. Now, I'll move over to Eileen, Eileen Ropes. You've worked here for how long? Oh, about 21 years, I think. And you're also a trustee, aren't you? Yes, I am. What's that yeah. you're working on now? Well, I'm trying to repair a leather jerkin, which has been worn by a large man, and he split it <laughs> under the arms and down the back and everywhere. We're trying with mender tear and the thread to put it together again. 
So it's mending day today. Yeah, it's mending day. What's the most difficult thing, or the funniest thing, perhaps, that you can remember in the 20 years having been asked to make? Oh, dear, there's so many one really can't. Um, this girl and her boyfriend came along wanting to do um, uh, part of the royal family for a, a carnival float. She thought she'd like to be Princess Anne. Well, I, I really was stunned. I, I just couldn't think. All I could think of was jeans and a sweater. No, no, she wanted to be a bit glamorous with that. So we found her a white frock. And uh, she said, and could I have a crown? And I said, well, no, I don't think Princess Anne wore a crown during the daytime, but you could have a pair of white gloves. So she had a nice long <laughs> pair of nylon gloves. Oh, the whole thing was wildly unsuitable, but she was very happy. She <laughs> adored herself. Lovely. Well, I'm going to go down to the wardrobe now. What do you yeah. suggest I ask to try on? Oh, well. What do you think would suit me? I remember once at school being dressed up as an Elizabethan boy. I'm short with short hair, you see. But I prefer the more glamorous things. Well, I suggest that you go as perhaps an Elizabethan lady. What do yes, you think? Yes. Or you could have a hen in. You could be medieval and have a hen in. What's a hen in? You know, it all and those great big pointed down. things yes, with, a with a flowing veil. Very becoming. Lovely. You have a shot. <laughs> Velda's brought me down to their wardrobe. It's more like a shed, isn't it? <laughs> it's a shed. Now, th this is the, the hen. Is hen it? Henin. Henin, uh, which is what I was being told about. Can I try it's it on? It's medieval. Late medieval. Gosh, which way round do we put it on? Oh, That's well, the front, is it? It has a little loop in the front and you mustn't show any hair. It's a bit difficult doing this one-handed and holding the microphone at once. Gosh, I wouldn't like to show no hair. No, My face well, looks fat enough as it is. Well, I can't help that. <laughs> so you were saying they shaved their foreheads? Well, they did in those days. They wanted to have high brows. I keep getting the black veil in my face. That's supposed to go around to the back, isn't yes, it? Yes. What would I wear with this in period costume? Well, a long, straight-down dress with a girdle. But how does this differ from a wimple? Oh, wimples um, fits close to the face, rather like a nun's outfit. Oh, yeah. Oh, I'd rather not. I'd rather have one of those, definitely. Yes. I'll take that off, as it's all getting <laughs> in my face. Uh, now, I know that you put give out costumes for the local players, and we just happen, happen to have with us J.C. Eaton, producer of uh, Blakeney Players. Yes, that's it. Tell me yes. about them. Well, uh, we put shows on in the summer uh, for the village and, of course, for the benefit of the holiday makers. We run from July till the first week in September, and uh, really, I suppose, the players have seen are seen by people from all over the country. Hundreds and hundreds of people come. What did you do this summer? This summer we did a completely original musical based on a Norfolk story, a true Norfolk story of the 16th century, and it was called Ralph of Wiverton. What do you do with the money that you collect? Does it go to help further plays? It, yes, yes, of course it does that, and also we give quite a bit to charities, and in fact there is a, a village hall uh, effort going on. We've got to have a new village hall, and we have donated a £1,000 this year towards... Uh, a new stage and stage equipment when we get the hall so that the players are, will have a home in which to perform. And what are you doing this Christmas? Uh, a review type thing. Some of the material will be original and some will be, uh, you know, existing material this time. But Ralph was completely original. And you, did you write it yourself and the music? I wrote the music and the lyrics and uh, uh, co collaborated with Margaret Luce on the script. We'll have to have a word with Margaret a little later, I think, and hear her Norfolk dialect. Yes, it's beautiful. Meanwhile, um, Bill over there, you were telling a funny story a minute ago and I think you ought to repeat it. Well, you were asking about funny incidents. Uh, I recall once when we were, had to go to Norwich to do a, a short Shakespeare thing and it's the only time I've ever trod the boards of the matter market and I had to have a pair of green tights or green something down my legs <laughs> and uh, no, the wardrobe hadn't got a pair of green tights until Velda, Velda Sprott, said, well, try mine. I think I've got a pair that you do. And actually, they did fit me. And uh, I was a great success in them. And after that, they called me Fitzwilliam, because what fits Velda's fits William. <laughs> <laughs> well, now, as you see, I've brought you into the school, of which I'm a correspondent. And I don't like to say this, Bill, but you seem to have a finger in all the pies there are in Blakeney. How's that? A bit of a poo bar. I think it was born in me. <laughs> uh, 
here you have Mrs. George, the headmistress, Mrs. Jean George, and I'd like to introduce you to the headmistress of Lakeley School. How long have you been here? I've been here just over 12 years now. So you're not really been here long enough to see the parents of, of some of the children here to have taught oh, them, no. are you? No, 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 not quite long enough for that, though some of the children that I first taught in the, in the school here are now married, so perhaps before long. How long has the school been here? 1863 it was opened, 100 and nearly 120 years. It's a lovely old flint building, isn't it? Has it been modernised because there's lots oh, of yes. little classrooms? What did it used to be yes, like? We, the original building was this very big classroom here that you see, and then one other classroom was added oh, at about 1900, I think. And, but then, in 1975, we really were modernised. Our rooms all had ceilings put in, and we had a central heating system added, and uh, our outside lavatories were brought inside, and uh, we were really made very comfortable. How many pupils are there here altogether at the moment? Only 40 now. Oh, it's a small school, isn't it? How many staff are there, total? Two of us, full-time, and one part-time teacher who comes in three days a week. You obviously don't come from Blakeney. How did you know that? <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't. I'm a northerner. What do you think of Blakeney? Oh, it's a lovely village to live in. This, and this is a lovely little school to work in. We think we are very lucky. What ages are the children that are here? They come in when they're four, just before they become five, and they stay with us until they're 11. What's this class being taught? I see all sorts of things, Lego and knitting and... It's, the, it's what we call our free activity period when we choose our own occupation. Within a reason. <laughs> yeah, well, we've been learning about sheep and wool. Uh, this is why you see some of us weaving here. And some of the little girls are just learning to use knitting needles for the first time. Perhaps Quite we, well. Perhaps I'll go and have a look and see what they're up to. Yes, do. Now you're going to sing a song for us. What's it going to be to finish? Right. come out of the um, school uh, we're standing right which is right next door to the church it's 20 right. to 3 gosh time's yeah. getting on what sort of church is it I mean we're standing looking at it the spire from here it's massive isn't it I don't know whether it is northern or not uh, these square towers are all over Norfolk and and, uh, and this is very unique which has got two towers one each end ah, you can't see that from here you can't see that one from here the other one the other one's got a lantern in it and uh, the popular idea is that the lantern was used for guiding ships at sea, which was most likely in the in the uh, olden days when there were very few lights. One could see that light for miles and miles and miles, and no doubt it was a landmark for all mariners at sea as they came up this Norfolk coast. Let's go and have a look inside. Ooh, it's quite a big church, isn't it? It is. It's a, a lovely old church. The 1286 is the first rector, according to this plate. Hamon Pesh, P E C H E. That's not in English now, I'm sure. No. It goes all the way through. 13, 14, 15. Not many in 1500s, were there? No, they are. They lived a long time. Or they were vacant. The office was vacant. So it's 1978, David Powes Morris. Yes, he's the he's canon of Norwich Cathedral. Canon of Norwich Cathedral, yes. And that's where he is today, I expect. Actually, he was sorry he couldn't be with us. Uh, you see, it's lovely architecture, though I'm not, a, I'm not qualified to speak on architecture, but the, it is the first thing that strikes you, the timbers, the timbers and the stained glass. I was going to say, it's the stained glass, I think, that's amazing. Stained glass. Doesn't Far more windows than you'd expect in stained glass, all along that wall. All of that, all? the entire east, um, south side. Quick, quick look around to see whether we're east, south or west. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but th this is the thing that strikes me. Now, this is what I want to show you over here. Oh, yeah. Here is the picture of... Now, look at that face. Look at that face. George Long, 
coxswain of the Blakeney Lifeboat, 1896 to 1920. Look at those eyes, that steadfast look in his face. Was he grandpa or father to Stratton Long? He's grandpa to Stratton Long, that's right, isn't it, Margaret? Grandpa yeah. to Stratton Long. Now, uh, this I would like to show you too. On the nights of January the 7th and 8th, 1918, in a northwest gale with frost and heavy snow, all hands, 30 lives, were rescued from two steamers by the following crew in the Blakeney lifeboat Catalyne. And there we go. And the average age, look, is... 55 years. 55 years. And those men ran two miles, easily two miles, to get to their lifeboat, pulled the lifeboat with their, by the hard labour method of rowing, and they rescued on two nights, probably got no sleep for, what, 48, 60 hours. 30 lives were saved. Now, Margaret, you've met us here because your father used to be, was it a coxswain or a member of the lifeboat? Yes, he was bowman and second coxswain. And uh, his father, my grandfather, was a coxswain. And that's his portrait that you've just been looking at. Can you remember when they used to have to go out? Well, no, I can't actually. <laughs> but uh, it was a, a rowing boat, row and sail, and after the channel silted up, you see, they couldn't get the lifeboat up to the quay, so they used to have to walk all the way down and get to it. You must better remember lots of stories he told you. Well, yes, one or two. When they, uh, they had one man to an oar, you know, and... and Sometimes, when it was very rough, they would have two men to an oar. And uh, there is a tale that uh, my grandfather was uh, in charge one day. And my father's younger brother, who was about 12 at the time, was on board. And as he was going down the channel, he just realized that he was there. And he said to him, Boy, if I'd seen you before we left the quay, I'd have chucked you in the channel. <laughs> <laughs> that answers my second question. Earlier on, I was told by Josie that you were the um, Norfolk character, voices and so on, in the plays, and I was going to ask you to give a quick demonstration. Oh, well, that's very difficult, isn't it? Can you think of any of the lines you did in your last play? Well, you see, you have uh, hulled me into a buffle, actually. Do you know what that means? <laughs> Thrown me into confusion. <laughs> and I've done that. <laughs> yes. We seem to have walked miles and miles and miles out on the marshes, especially so I could come and get some bird noises, which you can't hear, just the wind. Dan, you're in charge of the march marshes, aren't you? Do you get many visitors here then during the year? In the year, we get quite a lot, particularly in August, from roughly the middle of July to the middle of September, during the school holidays. And my worry here, of course, is that these marshes being very flat, if these people get too far out and they can go a mile or more from the actual marsh and the sea comes in very quickly, then of course there is trouble, or can be trouble, if we don't catch them in time. Well, so Dan is the warden for the marshes, and, and John, you're the warden for the point. What's the difference between the two areas? Well, the difference is really that the point is built up with sand dunes. We've got a small marsh inside, but mainly just the dunes. And the turnery is the big thing about the point, which everyone come to look at. It's quite a way away, isn't it, looking out? It's over an expanse of sort of sandy mud. How do you get there? Oh, yes, it's quite a way. We've either got to walk through the mud or, or take a boat. Or you can walk along from Chloe Beach, if you wish, which is a hell of a walk. Yeah, I've done that once, about eight miles. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm not going to do it today. The tides aren't right, are they? Otherwise we could have gone out in the boat, couldn't we? We could have done, but the tides are too early or too late. What sort of people do you get visiting the point? Well, we get all sorts, really, but uh, we get a lot of school children. They come to see the turns, which we show the parties round. So the people that come are tourists, not bird watchers? Oh, you get both. You get... Uh, the tourists and the bird watchers, but we try and show the people how important the point is to wildlife. How important is it? Very important, because we're one of the biggest turneries in the country. And uh, with educating the school children, I think this is the way we're going to get through to people. Well, what is a turnery? A turnery is a place where the, where the turns lay. <laughs> and we can protect them. It means the place where they lay, bring the young. But, uh, I mean, I'm fairly ignorant. I mean, a turn to me is just really another seagull. <laughs> You'll probably hit me for that, and so a lot of other people. <laughs> but surely you get 
seabirds like this all along the coast, everywhere. You do get them in patches along, of course, but as I just now said, we're one of the biggest terneries, and terns are a bird that migrate, especially come here to lay. And you just say to seagulls, well, the black-headed gulls are uh, here all the year round, and they can nest anywhere on the marshes, but terns need a specific area. Is that the main feature of the point? Because I, I know that I've heard of it in connection with seals as well. Yes, the seals are getting very popular nowadays. It's nothing to do with us seals, really. It's They're in the channel, and they're quite capable of looking after the cells. <laughs> uh, people are very interested in going and looking at them. But Now, you've been made warden very recently, only two months ago. What qualifications did you have to be a warden? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what qualifications? Well, it's a matter of a lot of jobs rolled into one. I presume, really, the main thing is I'm I want a local bloke and know the area. And uh, this helps a great deal. Of course, we've got to use boats a lot and we do coast guard work on the point. And I think this is why you need a local bloke with a bit of knowledge of everything. What did you do before you were a warden? I was a fisherman. In this area? From Wells, yes, and around this area. Yeah. So you're very interested, really, in how the point goes. What, what, what do you feel you would like to see happening to it? Well, that's easy, really. I would just like to say in 50 or 100 years' time, children can come down and see it as we can see it at the moment. They're uh, not spoiled at all. How have you enjoyed your two months so far? Four, sorry. <laughs> Don't need to wave your hands, you can't see it. Four <laughs> months so far. It's uh, interesting, because as I said, there's... Uh, several jobs while in the one, so you're not doing the same job every day. Uh, well, you were telling me a funny story a minute ago about... That was this... Uh, we took a school party around one day and uh, with a group of boys about 14 year old and we have two or three telescopes in the hides and one particular telescope was getting a lot of attention and uh, when I made my way over to it and looked through the telescope to see what these boys were looking at there's a nice new nude girl on the beach. <laughs> <laughs> bird watching in its literal a bird, sense. Yes, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> Not what they'd come to see. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> right, well, I think I shall have to come back when you've actually got the ternary. Is I think that would be possible. I think that would be a good idea, yes. We've got yeah. to wend our way back now across miles of muddy marshes. Do you reckon you'll find a better way back? We'll ask Dan if he, he can find a better way back. <laughs> How much was it you bet? Five quid that he couldn't? That's right. <laughs> The back part of the house is very old, it's Tudor, and it was called the lodge because it was the vineyard keeper's lodge for the slopes that are all around the Bath Hills here, all around the valley, uh, where grapes were grown. Not anymore, though. Not now, no, but the uh, Saxon times, Earl Bygod, who is a well-known Norfolk name, who built many castles in Norfolk, including Bungie Castle, and these were his vineyards, and Ditchingham grapes were grown for the Priory in Bungie, among other places. So there used to be Ditchingham wines as well? There used to be Ditchingham wines, and they are noted in the manorial records up to about 13, or middle of the 1310, 1314. You say the back of the house is Tudor. What's the front bit? The front part was built on in the early Georgian times, and, of course, that means the back part is a low, two-storied, timbered building. But the front part, where we are now, is three stories high, red brick, big Georgian windows, and shutters, slatted shutters on the outside, which make it very attractive facade. How long have you lived here? Well, it's been in the my husband's family for several generations, we have lived here since we came out of the Navy in 1961. Do you like Ditchingham? Very much. We are both, my husband and I, both born and bred in Ditchingham, so it is part of our bones and our heritage, and we're very fond of it. You're telling me a little bit of the romantic history of the house. Yes, we have got a bit of, of uh, history. Chateau Briand, who was the French émigré who came over at the French re time of the French Revolution, came over to Bungie and resided for a while because he fell off his horse and was taken to a house in Bungie and lived there with the Reverend Ives, who was the rector of Bungie, 
and fell in love with the Reverend Ives' daughter, Charlotte. She was only about 15 at the time. She fell in love with him. But nothing came of it, and he didn't think it was uh, very serious. And he was rather horrified when the Reverend Ives and Mrs. Ives approached him and said that they weren't in the least worried that he was an emigre and with no money, etc., etc., and that they would be very happy to have him as a son-in-law. <coughs> and this horrified him because, um, of course, he had a wife in France. So uh, he threw up his hands in horror and fled the house, went back to Beckles and returned to London and went back to France in about 1800. Uh, but Charlotte, the daughter, about three years later, married an Admiral Sutton. A rapid recovery. Well, fairly rapid recovery, <laughs> yes. And she came and lived down here. They lived down here at the lodge for about ooh, 30 to 40 years, very happily. But she still lives here, I hear. Ah, yes. Well, for those that can see her, she is still around. We have had guests who have seen her, some visitors who came to stay with us, asked me quite casually who it was who was helping wait at table on the supper. I said, good gracious, we're not that grand. We don't have people waiting at table. What was she like? And our guest described her with her long dark dress and dark hair and very piercing dark eyes. So I said, oh dear, I think you've seen our ghost because Charlotte Ives was known to have very bright dark eyes. This was an outstanding feature. And the very first sighting of her, which was between the two world wars when a relative lived in the house and a guest he had staying with him saw her. That was the description then, that she had these very piercing dark eyes and a portrait of Charlotte was produced at that time and the guest said, yes, that is the vision that I saw at night. She just presumably lives in the house as she lived in it and occasionally comes through the atmosphere to those, I say, who have the power to see her. I was eight when he died in 1925 <clears throat> uh, and I hadn't a great deal of contact with him because we didn't live in the, I didn't live in the village then, but I came to stay with him uh, and remember him as a, a very um, kindly, sympathetic character <clears throat> uh, whom I admired enormously. What did he look like? Uh, well, he had a, a, a very distinctive appearance, and he had a, a, a fine beard. Now, he's famous for the books he's written, amongst which I've read She and King Solomon's Mines. What else did he write? She and King Solomon's Mines, of course, were his classics. But um, lesser is known of him in that he did equally valuable work as a rural reformer. For instance, in 1909, he urged the Liberal government to set up the first Royal Commission on afforestation, and he subsequently served on that commission. But unfortunately, the schemes that he propounded were not implemented until after his death. But those schemes are now really embodied, embodied in the modern Forestry Commission. You've got one of the books that he's written concerning farming on your knee. What's that? Uh, yes, I got a copy of A Farmer's Year, which uh, he wrote in 1898, describing his day-to-day -day farming experiences on um, this, his farm here in Ditchingham, which I now farm. Um, now, just flicking through it, I've got an entry here for November the 21st in 1898, which is quite interesting, and it reads, Today is dull with a drizzling rain. Not heavy enough, however, to prevent us from drilling wheat on the little bit of land which has been ploughed after the maize was cleared. <clears throat> we are carting grit, also gathered from the highway, to spread about upon the surface of the seven-acre pasture. This stuff seems to be a perquisite of the road scraping men. Road grit, containing as it does all manner of finely pulverised refuse, is very valuable as a dressing for pasture land. Also, it can be put to good advantage by using it in the holes where young apple trees are being planted, especially if the soil beneath is clay, as the roots find it very kind to work in. That is the sort of entry that uh, 
goes on through the through the book, which is of immense interest, even a hundred years later. Now you farm the same land that he farmed. How does your farmer's year compare with his? I bet you don't use grit, for example. Of course, uh, techniques have changed enormously since then. And uh, although I farm about the same acreage as he did, um, he had a, a labour force of over a dozen, and I have a labour force of two. Ditchingham seems to be a very weird mixture of old and new, and there are a lot of fairly grand houses, what the hall, the house and the lodge. Why, why so many big houses in such a small village? Well, I have a theory that one of the few southern crossings of the River Waveney, which divides Norfolk from Suffolk, uh, in bygone days was in this area. And this tended to cause the concentration of big houses which were conveniently near to such a crossing for people who wanted to go south. Uh, it is of interest, if you look at Ditchingham House, you'll see that it is uh, a square Georgian house with a centralised chimney pot coming out of a, a slate roof. And at the end of the last century, it used to be known <clears throat> by the locals as Mustard Pot Hall, because that roof, which is now clear, was then covered in lichen, and the central chimney stack looked like a spoon rising out of a, a, a collection of mustard. Right, I think we're off to the village hall next, but have you got a piece of music you'd like us to play meanwhile? Um, well, if there's any choice, I'm a uh, lowbrow myself, or I shouldn't say that, perhaps, perhaps but uh, uh, I find Glenn Miller very, very listenable to now, I've moved from one of the older buildings in Ditchingham to one of the very newest, Ditchingham Village Hall. Uh, Mr David Pugh is with me. We're standing in the kitchen. A very nice kitchen, may I say, as well. Uh, why did you want a new village hall? Well, the village, as you see, just outside there is the old hut. It's an old army hut from the First World War. And it has served the village for over 60 years. And five years ago, the land on which it stands was given by the Carr Estate to the village, and it was decided then we should do something about building the village a new hall. So the old hut committee got together and uh, called a public meeting at which the position was outlined to them. They were told how the money could be obtained to build a new structure. Grants were available, but we in the village would have to undertake to provide 25%. Now, we set off with a target of about 30,000 building, we thought. Well, over the years, of course, owing to inflation, the target had, uh, we had to set our sights very much higher. We ended up with a target of 15,000 to be raised for a building of 60,000. How, how did you go about raising all the money there? Ah, now then, of course, this is where the committee came in. The social committee, which is a very active organization in the village, which provides uh, parties at Christmas time for the old folks and uh, also gives them a meal and also the ch uh, children's parties. They started us off with £600. And then, of course, uh, from coffee mornings to sponsored walks, sponsored rides, summer fates, Christmas draws, a hundred club and so on. All these have uh, well, resulted in the f fact that we managed to raise the very important sum of 18,000. And we also had considerable help from the Ditching United Charities who made grants to us over the years. And what have you got for your money? Well, we have, the, as you see, we have this splendid new hall which is used for dancing and badminton. Uh, it's, it's also used, we also have a very fine kitchen and a committee room with bar facilities so that we're able to rent the place out to outside organizations which of course help to make the thing financially viable because the cost of running a place like this is bound to approximate to three thousand pounds a year so who uses the hall well it there are 14 groups represented on the management committee and it's available to all these groups there's um, um, the good companions they're the over 60s there's the bingo uh, club. But that's also a popular a, one, isn't it? Yes, yeah, very popular with the, uh, a lot of popular with people inside and outside the village. Then, of course, uh, there are the brownies, the girl guides, 
the, there's a dancing class, and of course it's also um, available to any new groups that are formed. For instance, we're hoping that a dramatic group will be formed in the near I, future because we have not only a fine hall, but we also have a very nice stage. I was just going to ask you if you're putting on any Christmas productions, but obviously not. Yeah, well, uh, there's nothing arranged as yet, but the chances are that uh, the parties will have uh, some sort of entertainment arranged. Now, as secretary of the Village Hall Committee, you must have had most of the hard work to coordinate. Well, yes, but it could, couldn't have been done without the help of a very cooperative committee who put themselves out to, to no small extent, believe me. And, of course, we have been greatly assisted by the publicity we've had through the parish magazine, The Parishioner, which is a church magazine, and the people have been kept informed of any uh, fundraising event, and, of course, the state of our finances has been kept in the fore all the right throughout. Well, was it all worth it? Well, the, I think the village generally have been very surprised at the type of hall we managed to erect in place of the old village hut. I used to go when about 55 years ago, and um, we had an old schoolmaster by the name of uh, Hamilton. He was one-eyed, and he could see more with that eye, one eye, than he could with any of anybody would too when it come to mischief he saw everything we'd done and um, it used to have open fires uh, mother was a um, school caretaker for 19 years and then we used to have to take wood in and in a bath a bath full of wood would just about make enough sticks for the fire to start the fires in the mornings with do you know anything about the history of the school? Uh, yes, there was a Lollard school here in um, 1422. What's a Lollard school? A Lollard school was a school uh, by, run by a religious sect. Um, they done it for the middle class and the poor of different villages. It didn't last long, but it did give a bit of education to poor people. This school was built in 1840. 40 by Reverend Scudimore, who was rector of the village at the time. Yeah. Now, your mother was caretaker of the school, yes. wasn't she? Nice. Was it hard work for her? Well, it was, because it was uh, just bare boards. And every holiday, they were literally all scrubbed on your hands and knees. Now, you sound as if you're a right naughty girl at school. What sort of things did you use to get up to? Oh, well, you'd, uh, during uh, sewing class one day, I was making a night dress and I tried it on. And it was an old fashioned yoke nightdress. And I was made to sit in school all the rest of the afternoon in a white Windsor yes nightdress. <laughs> but, um, well, we just got up to the usual pranks, you know, jumping over the walls, kicking the ball over the wall. And if we let a top go over the one man's garden, he always used to give it back in two halves. He used to chop it in half for us. Of course, the swings in the playing field that we're looking at now weren't here then, were they? No, this was a pit. And when, when the summer time, when that was nice, we used to come on here. We used to play about on here. And if you got an old tin and gradually dug down, you'd go down about 18 inches and you were onto water. And we used to think it was lovely to find water. It was, we'd achieved something then. That was our dinner time occupation. <laughs> Electricity came down to the school in about 1930 when Mrs Webb says now it's modernised, that's when the electricity came down. And the <laughs> toilets were all wood toilets with a septic thing at the back, back that had to be emptied every month. Did you enjoy going to school? Loved it. <laughs> Go back tomorrow. <laughs> Violet, sitting on yet another swing. I reckon we're all kids at heart, yeah, aren't you? Yeah, I still am. <laughs> <laughs> You're a caretaker of the school now, aren't you? Yes, yes, I am. What changes have you seen since you were here? Well, uh, lots of changes really. We've, I've got a cleaner to clean the school with and everything is much more modern now because there's water laid on and they have wash basins and everything like that. It's really good for an old school really. It's not uh, hard work really. I don't make hard work of it though. Sometimes you get a bit fed up with the old building but uh, then I think to myself, well, after all my father did come here and I feel sort of part of the school, you know, part of the furniture. As Pearl was saying about the playing field, well when I came to Ditchingham it was a, an old rough pit and all old bushes and what have you and when the master came about 14 
uh, about 14 to 16 years ago. Uh, he said, he, well, we got a playing field committee up and we fundraised and had it all levelled off and uh, reseeded and is as it looks now. And we raised money to have it all tarmacked down at the side and all this flat bit here so they could play tennis. And all this was the, you know, equipment that we bought with money that was raised from parents and everyone in the village. They all clubbed together, you know, got together and were really enthusiastic about it and it's how it looks now. I've just been to the village hall where, of course, everybody raised money for that. Is there a lot of community spirit like this in Ditchley? Well, I think there really is. It, though, uh, there is just, you know, us, us lot, as we call ourselves. There is a certain amount in the village who want to really see our village thrive and get on. You've not always lived in Ditchingham. Do well, you no. like it? Yes, like it very much. I, I uh, was married about uh, 27 years ago and bought a house here, and I've lived here ever since. And I don't mind spending the rest of my life here, really, because I really do enjoy it, and I like the people and everything about it. I've moved into St Mary's Church, as no doubt you can hear by the bells ringing, and I've met the Reverend David Ward. David, why is the church so far away from the village of Ditchingham? Well, I think there are several reasons, but the most obvious one here is that if you put a compass where the church is and draw a circle round, you will find it is virtually the centre of the parish. But the river, which was navigable at one time, uh, was the means of transport for factories and uh, the like, so that when the railway came to, most of the people lived down in the south, but northeast and west of this church here is all agricultural and estate land. So that that is one main reason uh, why this appears to be so far from where most people live. Yes. How long has this church been here on this spot? Uh, this church, the the actual tower, the foundation stone, was uh, laid in 1479 by Bishop Goldwell, and the architect was James Wooderoff. But obviously there was a church here probably before the Norman Conquest, and we have a list of rectors from 1279, of which I suppose one of the most Notable of the vicars was uh, William Scudimore, who was here for over 50 years and his son for another 40, from 1839 to 1929. Which was here first, the church or the convent? Because Ditchingham is unusual in the sense that it has a convent and, and so on. Well, of course, the church was here long before the convent, and in fact, it was William Scudimore who was responsible for the convent being here. It moved from just across the river at a place called Ship Meadow. And he, I believe, gave the land. And certainly he was the first warden of the convent. You've got a book in your hand there, written by the Reverend J. Scudimore. Is that the Scudimore you're talking about? That is the son of the one I was talking about. It is, he wrote this history of Ditchingham. And... Uh, it's a most extensive document about the daily life and does record very interesting things about old documents which uh, are now being kept in, the, in, in Norwich. It seems that the village has a lot to thank the Scudamores for. Very much indeed. When, as I mentioned earlier about the river and the people living down there, they built a, a silk factory down there, uh, which is now a maltings, and in order to help the people down in that parish, William Scudamore himself designed, planned, and built what is now known as All Hallows Church, Perno. And a minute ago you were telling me about Mrs Scudamore's artwork in the church here. This uh, is really quite a magnificent ceiling to the uh, chancel and sanctuary, and also a reredos. It was hand-painted by Mrs. Uh, William Scudimore, with the assistance of the First Reverend Mother. As you see, the panels are high up, and they, they had to be slung up in order to paint them, because they were painted there 
in, in where, where they are well, they must now. have had to lie on their backs hanging up like window cleaners boards yes uh, rather like Michelangelo did in the Sistine Chapel I understand how long did it take them because it's a it's very intricate detail isn't it I've no idea but it it's certainly I wouldn't like to undertake it and I should think it must have taken several years fairly cold. Now you've got your gentleman in the background ringing the bells. Do you think there's any possibility of them showing me how to ring one? Yes, certainly. Certainly our ringing master will show you how to do it. Okay, gentlemen. I think you deserve a rest. <laughs> right then. Ken, you're the ringmaster, ring I think. Here What's that? Well, in charge of the tower, look after the bells and uh, oil the bells and so on and... Uh, arranged for our ringing, ringing nights. How often do you come in to ring? Once a fortnight for practice and uh, festivals and uh, weddings. Keeps you fit, I bet. Oh, yes, yes, that's, that's very good exercise, yeah. Something that intrigues me is how many others? Six bells? Six bells, yes. How do you know when it's your turn to ring a bell when you're doing a peal of bells? Well, it's practice. You have to study the theory of ringing. It takes about a year to learn to ring a course of plain barb, I suppose, from the time you start to get rope sight, which means to tell which bell you've got to go behind because you go after a different bell every time. But you stay on the same bell? On the same you? bell all for the whole time. And a full peel, 5,040 changes, is, uh, take about two hours and three quarters on these six bells. 5,000, does that mean... 5,040 changes. A different changes. doing for each one. Is, that a, is a change a doing on a bell? Yeah, well, yes, but there's only 720 changes on six bells, and you do that seven times for a peal of 5,040. What's the most complicated you've ever done? I've rang peals up here. Uh, Oxford, Kent, treble bob, plain bob. How did you ever get into this in the first place? Well, I started as a boy about nearly 50 years ago and uh, we had a good company then and uh, I got interested in it and well you'd have to have to like it that's all there's about that you have to like it and that's that's as much brain work as uh, brawn. Now what you were doing a minute ago wasn't a full peel what was it you were doing? On the, chiming the bells. And what's the difference? Well, the bells hang, hang down when you're chiming, and just so the clapper just touch, or the clap, or tongue, just touch the side of the bells. But when you're ringing them properly, the bells are what we call raised, and they take a full, full turn. Why don't, I was watching you do one of those a minute ago, why don't you disappear up into the roof with it? Well, you have to look out and don't break the stay. What? If you broke the stay, which stop the bells when they get in an upright position, as a stay that uh, will stop the bell, you ease it onto the stay and the bells will stay upright or just over the bounds. But if you pull too hard and you break the stay, the rope go up at 20 feet. Is it hard work uh, raising a bell? Uh, fairly hard work raising a bell. This one here, the tenor, sixth bell, that weighs 1,200 weights. And that's fairly heavy to ring, although there are a lot heavier bells in the country than these. <laughs> and you reckon that if I had one raised, I wouldn't be able to hold on to it? I don't think you'd be able to do it for a start, anyhow. Is it practice? Yeah, we want a few nights practice for that. <laughs> but could I just have a quick chime on one? Yes, you can have a chime on one. Oh, yes. show me how to do it then. Which one am I doing? The fourth. This is a... You're saying it's the oldest bell, isn't the it? The fourth bell, the oldest bell in the tower, 1380. How old? 1380. That's 600 years 600 old. 600 years old now, yes. How, how much life is there left in it? Years and years, we hope. <laughs> right, now. Hundreds of years yet. Now, hold on to this. I'm not going to do anything no, drastic, am I? No, you'll be all right. It's Just pull it. No noise yet. Oh, it's, it's got... You're helping me. <laughs> People, no one can see that. You ain't got no strength yet. I will have it. Right. Do you have to keep it... It's a rhythm, keep, doesn't it? Yeah. Okay, look. Don't let it go too high. <laughs> he says, well, I've made a noise, I'll let go. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Frightened, I let it disappear at the top. Could you show me how to raise a bell? Would you mind doing yes, that? I'll raise a bell now. So, David, if you can tell me what's happening as he does it. You have to loose, let loose all you the... Call this well, you call this your hand for a start. I thought you said you shouldn't do that a minute uh, ago. Uh, uh, when you're raising it, you should. 
Because you said that if you wrap it around your hand and it goes over the top, you uh, disappear up with it, don't after, you? After you're ringing, yes. You mustn't know it when you're ringing, but to raise it, you do. Right, off you go then. What's that? Now, you see this picture of the bells here. You can see with the bell with its mouth up. Now, these bells <laughs> well, have, hard at work. the moment are down, and what Ken Garrett's trying to do is swing the bell back and forward like that, as you were doing, in fact. Or trying and, to do. Or trying to do, <laughs> until we get it in the right upward position. Now you'll notice that he doesn't have the rope coiled round his hands. Oh, I, I see. And it's at the top that'll, now, isn't it? That'll stop. That'll stop. Stop either way, no? Stop there, look. On the stay. You can just feel it. And pull it. And it's... And it's going to, I wouldn't better reach if it was going right up, would I? No, would you let the rope out? That's right at the top. That's up now, yeah. That's, that's like that is now. Like that. And when I pull it down and start with it again, that's right round to the other one, round to the other, full circle. He can't reach it. <laughs> <laughs> right. Thanks very much for showing me. Could we have a, a final chime, do you think, gentlemen? I mean, I've got ring it down. Right. Look, oh, you have to ring it down yes. to get it down to the. I've just decided this is much better than going jogging, isn't it, every day? I'd much rather do this. Very good exercise. This is if you want to take up a good pastime, exercise and keep slim, this is the job. I don't know if that's a subtle hint or not. <laughs> exercise your brain as well. Right. You want another chime now? Yes, please. Sounds lovely. And to finish, is there a piece of music you'd like us to play for you? Yes, I'd like the um, Alleluia Chorus from Handel's Messiah. Well, at last I arrived at our final port of call, the bathhouse. And it's not quite like other grand houses, it's more like a cosy farmhouse built on the banks of the River Waveney. Now, to tell me all about it were going to be Mr and Mrs Dewey who live there, but they couldn't get here today, and so Dorothy is. Dorothy, can you tell me a bit about the history of the house? Uh, yes, it's a Tudor house, like the vineyard keeper's cottage around the other side of the valley. And in fact, its claim to fame came in the 18th century when a Mr John King, who was an apothecary in Bungay, uh, he inherited the house and he found a spring bubbling up from the foot of the steep hill and he decided that it was, had mineral qualities and was good for a spa. So he built a bathhouse over it and advertised and soon he had a clientele coming from all over the area to um, come and bathe in his, his mineral waters and affect their cures for rheumatism and arthritis and things like that. Did it work? Uh, good question, good question. People believed it did and he wrote an essay on hot and cold bathing in which he quoted a lot of cures. And if I may quote one now, which I think is very amusing, it was a Roger Hawes, who was a tailor in Beddingham in Norfolk, from a weakness fixed upon his ankles and knees, became incapable of walking. But after a fortnight's cold bathing, he did so well recover the use of his legs as to run away without paying for his immersions. <laughs> I'd have thought after a fortnight's cold bathing, your legs would never work ever again. <laughs> well, I think it was probably the shock of the cold water which did it. <laughs> What's happened to the spa now? Because it certainly doesn't exist as such. No, no popularity declined. And in fact, the, bath, the house in which the bath was situated was pulled down at the end of the last century but the name bathhouse was transferred to the Tudor cottage you can see here. And now it's a private residence. My great aunt bought it in 1928, I think, and she lived there and wrote a lot of her books and essays and articles there. And now it's just a very pleasant, placid house in the country. That was Lilius Ryder Haggard. I didn't know she wrote as well. Oh yes, yes, she was um, quite a prolific writer and she wrote in the EDP daily for many years and these articles have been put into a book called Norfolk Notebook and Country Scrapbook 
and she also wrote a biography of her father, Ryder Haggard, called The Cloak That I Left. Because, of course, she was his youngest daughter. That's right, yes. What's happened to the spring? Does it still exist? Oh, yes, it does. It still bubbles up and produces about 800 gallons of water a day. But it's now pumped into the bathhouse and is used as the domestic water supply there, so they should be pretty healthy down there. Have you ever been and sampled the waters yourself? Oh, definitely. When Aunt Lil used to live there, when we walked around to have tea with her, we, Mum always made us have a drink of the water as we went by. <laughs> Did it do any good? Uh, well, I'm a bit young to tell yet, but I haven't got arthritis or rheumatism yet. 